Good evening, everyone. It's uh, this, this um, informality that we're having in this friendly get together is what we want to do tonight. We are uh, very pleased to have Howard Coffin here and Rob Eide here. They're going to talk, Rob will, uh, uh, Howard will talk a bit about these letters, and Rob is going to make a special presentation. And when this is over, please stay. We have beer and wine. And with this size crowd, you'll be well supplied. <laughs> There is soda, there is water, there is non-alcoholic things. Um, I'm Bob Jolly, Athenaeum Director. Thank you for coming. It's a beautiful evening, and you could be somewhere else, but you're here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read what I wrote so I don't forget what I wrote, and why, why bother writing it if I'm not going to read it? We're grateful to have renowned Civil War historian Howard Coffin here <clears throat> um, to formally give the Athenaeum a letter signed by Governor and Senator George Aiken when I was talking to Howard I referred to him as governor, and Howard said senator. That's how people remember him. So um, it, it's because of also talking to Howard that his wife would call him governor. And, and this letter, this one, the handwritten letter from Lola, really refers to him as governor and the affection that people had from him as governor. So I, I think, adopted that as a term, but it's senator and governor. And we are pleased to have Rob Ide, Commissioner of the Vermont Department of Vehicles, here to present Howard with a special gift. Though they're both renowned and they need no introduction, they're going to get one anyway. <laughs> Robert Ide, Commissioner of Vermont Department of Motor Vehicles, was first appointed Commissioner in August 2009, leading up to his tenure. This is better. I'm running out of arms here. Um, Sorry, leading up to his tenure with the Department of Motor Vehicles, I'd served as selectman for the town of St. Johnsbury before he was elected to the Vermont State Senate in 1992. He remained a senator until March 2003 when he resigned his Senate seat in order to accept the appointment as Vermont's Director of Energy Efficiency in the administration of Governor James Douglas. In June 2008, I transferred to the Department of Public Service to head the rail division of the Vermont Agency of Transportation. While serving in the Vermont Senate, Rob Ide was a member of both the Transportation and Appropriation Committees. At the time he left the Senate, he was the vice chairman of both committees. In 1994, he was elected by his legislative colleagues to a four-year term on the Board of Trustees of the Vermont State College System. Prior to his work in public service, he was employed in his family's feed and grain business in St. Johnsbury, where he was president of the corporation during the divestiture of the Ide family feed stores. He has a long time commitment to learning and was instrumental in coining the phrase first generation Vermont college student. And Rob, I was not able to find out how many generations your family is here. Eight. Well, Tim, Mary, and I are eight. Our grandchildren are ten. That is yours to be, Howard. When I introduce Howard, he is a seventh generation, at least as of the time of my getting this information. So. <laughs> These are people who have been around here. When you look at the old photos, their names are on, on the buildings. <clears throat> and I meant also to say of Robert Ide, like Humphrey Bogart, Frank Sinatra, and Winston Churchill, he does the bow tie justice. <laughs> Howard Coffin is a seventh generation Vermonter. There, the gauntlet has been thrown down. With six ancestors who served in the Vermont Civil War regiments, he has given more than 300 talks on the Civil War in Vermont alone and leads tours of Civil War battlefields. A member of the Vermont Sesquicentennial Commission, he was appointed by the U.S. Senate to the Civil War Sites Advisory Commission and served on the boards of the Association for the Preservation of Civil War Sites and the Civil War Trust. Long involved in historic preservation, he delivered the keynote address dedicating the Vermont Monument on the Wilderness Battlefield. He and U.S. <clears throat> Vermont Senator James Jeffords led the efforts to add 500 acres to where the Vermont Brigade fought to the Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. His books, as you probably know and own, include Full Duty, Vermonters in the Civil War, Nine Months to Gettysburg, The Battered Stars, and Guns Over the Champlain Valley, and Something Abides, Discovering the Civil War in Today's Vermont. Please welcome Howard Coffin and Rob I.
Thank you very much, Bob. I thought I'd spend a few minutes sort of describing how we all came to be here this evening. And I will tell you all um, in Caledonia County, my home county, that I feel like I've had a very blessed life in public service and I have met some wonderful, wonderful Vermonters all over the state and I consider Howard Coffin to be one of those and a very, very good friend. Howard thinks my first name is Hay. He, he, he never realized my mother thought Robert would be better, but if I hear Hey I'd, I know it's Howard Coffin. A lot of other people call me different things, but Howard always calls me Hay, and I'm good with that. Um, I really became best acquainted with Howard in 1999 when the Fairbanks Museum, through the efforts of my cousin Peggy Pearl, organized a trip to um, Civil War battlefields, and Howard was our guide on that. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful trip in the fall of that year. And I've seen Howard not only in the State House and on the streets of Montpelier, but also at a number of high school basketball games where he, was, he is an absolute ardent fan of the sport and uh, has been seen in, I think, every gymnasium in the state of Vermont. We're here tonight, um, in my mind, because one of my jobs as motor vehicle commissioner is the assignment of low-digit plates. And for a lot of Vermonters, low-digit plates have absolutely no meaning, and I'm okay with that. And for another segment of the population, having a three or a four-digit plate is very, very um, important to their, to their personhood. And um, it's a hard thing to explain, but there seems to be a certain amount of competition. But it wasn't so long ago when I got the list, which I get monthly, of plates that have become available because someone has either moved away or they're no longer driving, um, that there was a plate number that just stood out to me, uh, just absolutely seeking um, a Civil War historian. And Howard immediately came to my mind. So I placed a phone call to Howard to say that this particular number had become available and I wanted to be sure he had it on his car. And I left this message on, a, um, on his answering machine. And a few days later, he called back and said, well, you know, I don't know. It's um, sometimes I might park in a place where I don't want to be recognized. <laughs> So I was going through my Rolodex of potential Civil War people who would be appreciative of the number and not going very fast because I thought maybe he'd change his mind, but I wasn't sure he was going to change his mind. Um, and a few weeks later, I got a call one day and Howard said to me, hey, I got something I want to show you. Um, are you a, a, around your office? And I said, yeah, I, said, I am, and this is the time over the next few days. And so Howard came down and he had these letters and, and he was very interested in getting these letters into the Northeast Kingdom where they could be preserved, could be shown, and could be enjoyed because the, the conversation always goes along about who really named and when did they really name the Northeast Kingdom. And um, so we, we looked at the letters and we started to talk about where they should be and uh, Howard was asking me about my connections in the area and um, you know, we had the conversation about should they be at the, at the museum, should they be um, at the St. Johnsbury Historic Center where, as I said, my cousin Peggy is involved. And Howard said, well, what about the Athenaeum? I said, well, you know, I'm good with the Athenaeum. And Howard remembered coming here doing research on the Civil War and the um, service that he was afforded by Lisa and Lorna when they were here. And, um, so I could, I could see that I better get on board with this conversation, that the Athenaeum was becoming a very good place. And then he said to me, he said, do you have a contact with the Athenaeum? And I was really thrilled to say, yes, I do, because my sister, Mary Swainbank, is the vice chair of the board of trustees. And I think that's what locked it down, the fact that I had a relative here, and he was coming here anyway, because he immediately said, let's do it there. Um, the, we started to talk about his vision for this event, and this is exactly what he was trying to put together, was a group in this room where he could come, where he could present the letters, where, we could, um, where he could talk about his relationship with both George and Lola Aiken. And um, he told me a wonderful story that day about the Victory Bog, which I think he's gonna, gonna get into tonight. And I came back and said, well, what about the plate? Are you, would you have any interest in the plate? <laughs> And, um, you know, salesmen never give up. And there was a certain twinkle in his eye, but he didn't really agree to it. But then I got another call and said, you know that plate? He said, 
Maybe we should do that in St. Johnsbury. So that's what I'm really here to do, is to show you this plate, which is so perfect for Howard Coffin. And um, I think when you see the number, you will think so too. So Howard, I'd like to give you this plate. in 24 hours they will be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, now I know it was the right thing to do. And I know it has the outside look of something of a deal. I give the plates and the letters come over, he gives the plates and the letters come over, no. The, these really are two separate matters. Uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, just quickly before I have a couple things to say, I want two wonderful friends of mine to stand up back there, Vicki and Tom Hardy. Up you go, up you go, come on. Uh, uh, Vicki, uh, she sort of runs the Supreme Court over in Montpelier. <laughs> and Tom Hardy has been everything in this state. He was Secretary of, Assistant Secretary of Agriculture, a state policeman, and now he's a medical inspector, and he's my pastor down at the Bethel Church. And my wife didn't die that long ago, and he was a rock for me, and uh, I'm so happy to have them here, but it's nice to see you all here. 1865. You know, let's be honest here. My reluctance about taking those plates, I have some very obscure license plates, and you know, some of the plates that were made a few years ago didn't last very well. It's not your fault, Rob. <laughs> But you know, they faded and mine is so badly faded, I don't think you could read it. And some nights I do go down to Sweet Melissa's Bar in Montpelier and hear the wonderful music and perhaps have a beer or two. And so I told Rob, you know, I, I'm gonna be an easy to spot, you see, coming out of there, you know, night after night. But let's face it, you know, I'm 75. And I'm not going to be getting in much trouble anymore, I don't think. So I began to think this over and said, sure. And I just think this is wonderful. And you know, to get 1865 in St. Johnsbury, I think 1865, by the way, is the most important year in the history of the United States of America. Uh, the Union won the Civil War. By doing so, we ended slavery and made a reality out of the Declaration of Independence that said that all men are created equal. And if Lincoln hadn't been shot in 1865, I don't think we'd have the sectional differences that we had today. He would have brought on a reconstruction that would have lasted, I think, but that didn't happen. But here in St. Johnsbury in 1865, the most memorable thing that I remember about it is that when word came up here that Lee had surrendered to Grant at Appomattox on the 9th of April. When the telegraph moved the word up here, there was a tremendous celebration in St. Johnsbury, and there was a great parade through town that went right by where this building would be, and right out at the intersection of those two roads, a casket was buried to symbolize the death of the Confederacy. And it might be an interesting archaeological dig someday because I think it's still there. But anyway, thank you. Rob, thank you all because I'm going to have fun with these. And they may even help me sell some books. You know, I can always use that. Well, the letters. The time has come in my life to begin sorting through things and deciding what to do with things. And it's an awful job because I am a collector and I do collect Civil War history and art. But I, over the years, I've collected many letters and I wrote to George Aiken, what, 30 more years ago? Just after he retired from the Senate. And I always called him, by the way, I always called him governor. That's what he liked to be called, but you know, he was a senator, so you have to kind of work that in too. 
What a senator he was. I wrote to him and I asked him, did he really name the Northeast Kingdom? I had never seen anything in writing about that and he wrote back this letter that said, yes, he did. And when he came here, he often brought his fishbowl. And Lola, who and she and I were friends, although we, we had some rough times when I was a newspaper reporter, uh, she added a note at the bottom. And then later, after he died, she sent me this letter I had written to her asking her to put into words his appeal to Vermonters, and she did it magnificently. So I thought those letters should be here. They certainly should be up here in the kingdom. It's said that Aiken first used the phrase Northeast Kingdom in a speech uh, at the uh, Darling Inn in Lindenville in 1949. And Aiken is quoted as saying that he didn't mean to say that, that he, the phrase just came out of his mouth. And uh, so it uh, began. Now that's an interesting place for him to have said that because I had a brief and indistinguished career at Linden State Teachers College. I went there in 1960 and early in 1963, after my last day of pra first day of practice teaching, I uh, stuck out my thumb and hitchhiked away and never came back. <laughs> I was not meant to be a teacher and I was flunking out anyway. And, uh, but anyway, my last room at Linden was at the Darling Inn, so maybe history somehow ties together there. But anyway, uh, this seemed to be the place for them because the Athenaeum has been wonderful to me. I've spoken here several times. By the way, your, your figures aren't quite up to date on my, I'm now up to 600 Vermont speeches. And I don't know how many much more I've got left of them, but some of them have been given here. And also in that writing room up back there, uh, I wrote part of one of my books, uh, The Battered Stars, a great place to, to write back there. Uh, this is the place where I thought they should be, and I bring friends here, and I stop here many more times than people know to look at the paintings particularly. Uh, I'm glad you have them. I'll say more about this in a minute. I thought tonight I'd just say a couple things about Aiken that you maybe don't know. Uh, probably you do if you've lived around here very long, but George Aiken, uh, first of all, he was elected to the Vermont House of Representatives in 1931. He had grown up uh, in Putney. He had become a farmer in Putney and he started a nursery raising plants and fruits. Uh, he was good at it. He wrote two books on wildflowers. And in 31, he runs for the House and two years later, he's elected Speaker. And he takes on the Republican establishment and he gets elected, it's amazing. See, there was a social, there was socialism in Aiken. He sort of precedes Sanders in a way, you know. There's, that socialism could appeal to Vermonters even way back then. And then in 1941, Aiken amazes the state by running for the U.S. Senate against Flanders. My God, the powerful Republican state powerhouse, Ralph Flanders and beats him and gets elected to the Senate and stays there for 37 years. Becomes the senior member of the United States Senate. Vermonters are very smart about electing senators. They elect Aiken and he rises to be dean of the United States Senate and seniority counts for everything in the Senate. And I was Jim Jeffords' press secretary, remember. And who then they, do they replace Aiken with? Pat Leahy, who breaks his record for consecutive years served in the Senate. And we've got all that seniority on our side now. It's very, very smart. If we do well in Washington, it's no accident. Well, Aiken had a funny thing about dams. And I never could figure the guy out. When he was about to retire in 1975, uh, the Senate offered him a farewell gift. Now, Aiken had sort of run when he was in running for the legislature and then for governor against a plan to construct 80 dams in Vermont. 
not only for flood control dam, but make sure that the power companies had an adequate supply of water for their dams. Aiken didn't like power companies. But yet, when he's going home for the final time, he asks for money to build a flood control project at Ludlow on the Black River. But the time passes and nothing happens, and it's almost time for him to go home. And one day in the Capitol uh, hallway, he can tell me the story, he meets Wayne Morse of Oregon, a power in the Senate, and he says, Wayne, I'm going home in a couple of weeks and I haven't gotten that money for those, that flood control day. Well, Morse said, George, you know, you ask for a lot of money. And you know, that's not that easy. How much is it? Aiken said, well, it's 440. Morse said, well, George, even down here, that's a lot of money. And Aiken says, 440,000? And Morse said, oh, I thought you wanted 440 million. <laughs> he could have had 440 million. <laughs> but he took the 440,000 and built a flood control down at uh, Ludlow, and it's still there. By the way, after his first wife died, three weeks later, he hired, he, he married his chief of staff, Lola Parati. Everybody knew his first wife didn't like politics and she kept in the background. But when he married Lola, he took her off the payroll. He was cheap. <laughs> but anyway, Aiken and dams. Aiken did like a few flood control dams. He wanted some flood control dams in Vermont because he'd seen the, the 27 and then the flood in the 30s, you know, and he wanted particularly one at Cambridgeport down by Bellows Falls on the Saxons River. He wanted one at Gaysville on the White River, and he wanted one on the Moose River at Victory. Well, I was a newspaper reporter at the time, a state reporter, and I could do just about as I pleased until I became a political reporter. And I did a series of articles on flood control dams, how they worked and the ones that existed, you know, there's one at Wrightsville, uh, uh, there's one at uh, uh, Heart, North Heartland, you know, there's down near Thetford, there's one, they're all over the state, big sons of gun, you know. And uh, as I was writing this story on what they were and what they did, I learned that there were some people in Vermont who didn't think they were very good ideas. And I got in touch with some people in Cambridgeport who were really trying to stop that dam. And I wrote a story on the negative side of the dam. And then some people along the White River in Gaysville contacted me. And that dam would have drowned 10 miles of the White River Valley. And so I started looking at those dams more closely, and then I came up to Victory. And I met Fred Mould over at, uh, across the street there at the Fairbanks. And I got a whole different story on flood control dams, and they won me over, and it was advocacy journalism, believe you me. I could really take shots if I wanted to, and I became an opponent of the flood control dams. We stopped Cambridgeport. After a long fight with a lot of citizens getting involved, we stopped the dam down at uh, Gaysville on the White River. But Aiken wanted victory. He wanted victory, he said, because it would be a great boost to the, the depressed economy of this area. It would have been a 2,800-acre recreation lake. And if you go out there today to Victory, it would have been at what they call Damon Crossing. It was an area that we called Victory Bog. There is a true bog out there, but it's just a small part of that vast mountain basin, you know. You get out there and it just stretches away to the mountains. It's just a beautiful place. And I camped there a couple of nights and went all over and I said, this is just too beautiful. And then people all over the state began to get concerned about it. And I found out a scientific study that said if you filled up, if you, if you filled up that basin with water, it would be the water the color of weak tea. Now, who's going to want to swim in that or get your nice white boat all dirty? Now, that was a telling factor. But Aiken would not give in. Finally, there was a meeting called here in St. Johnsbury, and the Fish and Game Commissioner, Ed, Edward Keel, who became a close friend of mine. Phil Hoff had appointed him, but now he was working for Davis, who was supporting the dam. He got up in the middle of that meeting, and he hadn't told the governor or anybody else, and he announced that he was going to buy a good share of the land out there that would be flooded. 
and make it a game preserve for his department. That was a wonderful thing to do. I mean, wow. And then Davis began to give and give it. So one afternoon, was it 72, 72? I was in the Herald newsroom and the phone rang and one of the other reporters said, uh, Coffin, it's, it's George Aiken on the phone for you. So I picked up the phone I said, as I always said, Governor. And he said, Howard, I don't think we need that dam at victory after all, click. <laughs> I danced around the newsroom. I shouted and laughed. People thought I was nuts. And then I sat down to write the story that the victory dam was dead, and it was. And I still try to go out there at least once a year to look at that magnificent place. George Aiken was a great United States Senator, a great Vermonter. That was a mistake that he would have made, but he didn't. And afterwards, later on in his retirement, he told me he'd hung on to it too long because he liked, he liked this place. The people up there, he said, don't put on airs and always welcome you. He loved the Northeast Kingdom. And so do I. Over the years, of course, the things that have brought me here the most are Civil War related, researching my books. Let me just talk to you quickly. I'm not gonna go on here. About some of the places that I've come to love. There's a field, an old farmer's field, up above the Black River up in Craftsbury that was the site of a farm at the time of the Civil War. A farmer and his wife had four sons and all the boys went off to war and they all died. When I stand in that field today, you can look down over the bank from the hay field, whether you can still see where there was a swimming hole. And of course those boys, after a hot, itchy day and a bringing in the hay, you know, would have run down that bank and into that water, you know, happy as could be, and then they're all gone. It's one of the saddest places I know in Vermont, but there's a beauty to it. Up in Peachum, there's that old house that Thaddeus Stevens' mother bought, so he could be close enough to Peachum Academy, so even though he was club-footed, he could walk a mile there and back every day so he could go to college, and did he go to college? Went to Dartmouth. And then he became the most powerful member of, the, of Congress during the Civil War and led the battle to end slavery. A great American. I love to see that house. And you can just see the trace of that road he walked every day. There's a hill just north of Guildhall that before the Civil War, it was, it was cleared, at the time of the Civil War, it was cleared and it was a great picnic area that had a tremendous view of the Connecticut Valley. And up in that area, the, the, the Connecticut does a series of loops. And after the Civil War began, the people up there picnicking one day realized that those loops spelled union. And, and ever thereafter, they went up there to read union. You know, it's amazing how things influence you like that. I love that. It's all wooded now, it's hard to see. But if you look at a, a highway map, one of Rob's highway maps there, uh, and trace that, you'll see a kind of union written the way the river turns. And then, of course, there is victory. And yes, I managed to find a few soldiers who went from victory to fight in the Civil War. Uh, and uh, even a couple of foundations out there associated with houses where they had lived. And then there is St. Johnsbury with its magnificent Civil War history. The third Vermont camped and formed up and went to war down south of here where the interstates come together down there. 10,000 people came to watch them drill. Governor Fairbanks went down to present them with their flag. 80 boys from this town died 
in the Civil War. So I've come here time and again, and most of the time I've stopped at this magnificent place right here. If George Aiken named this three county area a kingdom, well, this is its castle. When New Englanders came to make settlements where brooks met and where the water fell, oh yes, they built the barns and the homes and the necessities, but soon they discovered they could not live by bread alone, and they began to build the churches, and then they began to build the places for the mine. And out of that came this perhaps most magnificent of Vermont buildings. And here it is, tonight, only the slightest richer for a couple little letters. But thank God that you have them. Guard them well. Love this place as I love it. Keep it here because I'm coming back. Thank you for this evening. Invited to enjoy refreshment.